at a double digit drawdown. Bitcoin prices experienced a brief recovery at the start of the week, climbing from last week's lows of $58,221 to the $64,500 level on Monday. However, the leading cryptocurrency struggled to break through the $65,500 resistance zone. On Tuesday, prices fell below $63,000 before bulls attempted and failed again to surpass the $65,000 resistance. Currently, Bitcoin is trading below $63,000, facing immediate resistance near the $63,350 level. Another key resistance lies above $65,000, particularly around the $65,500 mark which has been a significant hurdle for bulls. A clear move above this resistance could push prices higher, potentially exceeding $66,000 and approaching $68,000 per coin. Despite being in a bull market, the cryptocurrency sector has seen considerable volatility recently. However, expert analysts and industry leaders continue to reassure investors that volatility is intrinsic to the cryptocurrency market. Renowned hedge fund manager Mark Yusko advises Bitcoin investors to embrace volatility, noting that it is a fundamental aspect of the market. He asserts that price drawdowns and declines, though challenging, are necessary for the substantial rallies that investors find appealing. In a recent interview with Jim Friend, host of the Advancing Our Church podcast, Yusko shared his optimistic outlook on the cryptocurrency industry for 2024 and beyond, arguing that Bitcoin is a superior investment compared to traditional asset classes like stocks, bonds, and cash. Stop. You don't have time. Don't miss out this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself first ahead of the crowd. We have created the ultimate step-by-step -step crypto cheat guide that will guide you this bull run. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Now by clicking on the link below to get your exclusive copy just under $10. Zero exposure to this technology, this innovation was wrong. Well, why was it wrong? Well, look, I've been around a super long time. Just, you know, lucky, fortunate, and... I've seen every attempt at diversification. Like when I started in the business, I am this old, it was frowned upon for fiduciaries to own stocks, right? Remember the cover story in 1979, death of equities, no self-respecting fiduciary should ever own equities again because the market had been dead money for a decade from 68 to 79. People were fed up and they're like, you know, just own bonds. And then Arisa came along and said, no, you really need to own stocks. And then you got to own international stocks. And then you got to own hedge funds and private equity. And, and this all came to Markowitz, who I fortunately got to study under at Chicago. You know, great blessing. And Dr. Markowitz won the Nobel Prize for saying, when you take cash, the riskiest asset you could ever own. He said, no, 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 it's the safest. Oh, no, 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 no. It's the safest in that you don't lose anything. But every day, the Fed is stealing a little bit of your wealth through inflation, so you're getting less rich. So if you start with cash and you add bonds, which bonds can default, they have risk, that portfolio is actually less risky. When you add stocks, risk goes down. When you add international equities, risk goes down because they're uncorrelated to one another. But here's the problem. All these uncorrelated assets that follow Markowitz diversification they're kind of uncorrelated. Stocks and bonds are 30% correlated. International stocks, 60% correlated. Small cap stocks, 80% correlated. Value and growth, 85% correlated. Hedge funds, 70% correlated. So yes, they do lower. Like if I had real estate or hedge funds or private equity, I do lower the risk. And Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Harvard have mastered this. Uh, same with Notre Dame. But here's the thing. Bitcoin is not only the best performing asset over the last 15 years, it's also the lowest correlated asset. It has 0.0, .0 correlation to bonds. What does that mean? All that means is that what if bonds go up, you don't know what Bitcoin's going to do. If bonds go down, you don't know what Bitcoin's going to do. They're totally uncorrelated. It doesn't mean negatively correlated. I mean, it doesn't mean one zigs when the other zags. It just means there's no information content in what bonds are going to do and Bitcoin's going to do. And Bitcoin is 0.15 correlated to stocks. So when you add it to a portfolio, the return per unit of risk, the return per unit of volatility, the sharp ratio, goes up more than anything else. So if you had just taken 1% a decade ago, right, and put it into Bitcoin, your portfolio, instead of compounding at nine, would have compounded at 11 with less risk. Hmm. What if I'd taken 2%? 
then you would have compounded at 3% higher. What if I put 5%? You would have compounded at almost 10% higher. Now, this is not promissory. That's not saying this is going to happen in the future. But what it says is that we have this asset. And the reason it's uncorrelated is because stocks, bonds, etc., all rely on the same thing. They rely on interest rates, GDP growth, demographics, inflation. Okay. Bitcoin doesn't rely on any of that. Bitcoin is all about the digital divide. I ask, I tell, I tell this time, ask anyone over 35, who's your broker? Oh, I don't know, UBS, Merrill Lynch, why? How much gold do you have? I don't know, three, four percent. How much Bitcoin do you have? Oh my gosh, zero. Are you kidding me? It's a Ponzi scheme. Haven't you heard that Peter Schiff guy? How often do you use DeFi? What the heck is DeFi? What are you talking about? Okay, ask anyone under 35, and DeFi stands for decentralized finance. Right. So ask anyone under 35, who's your broker? What's a broker? I mean, I have a Robinhood account. Okay, how much gold do you have? Whoa, are you kidding me? Boomer rocks? Zero. Haven't you heard that Peter Schiff guy? How much Bitcoin do you have? I don't want to talk about it. Why not? Because it's like a really big percentage of my net worth. I'm kind of embarrassed. How often use DeFi? Every day. So that digital divide is real. One significant event that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency investors are eagerly anticipating is the announcement of rate cuts by the U.S. Federal Reserve. Last week, Bitcoin received a boost from Fed Chair Jerome Powell's notably dovish comments. Powell reinforced plans to announce rate cuts before the end of the year while speaking at a press conference following the FOMC's May meeting. He stated, we know that reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we have seen on inflation. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. Powell also mentioned that further rate hikes are very unlikely, which the market interpreted as additional assurance of upcoming rate cuts. Bitcoin and other risk assets reacted positively to this news, suggesting potential significant price gains when the Fed begins cutting rates. Peter Brandt a seasoned commodities and foreign exchange trader, commented on Bitcoin's current market phase, describing it as a typical bull market continuation. In a social media post, Brandt wrote, If Bitcoin can hold these lows and move higher, the chart will qualify as a very common bull market continuation chart construction. Now, let's return to Mark Yusko's interview, where he further discusses the importance of volatility in the cryptocurrency market. Volatility is your friend. I have a shirt, and it says, Embrace Volatility. Because again, this goes back to Markowitz theory. And again, he won the Nobel Prize. It's not me making this up. What you want is a collection of the highest volatility assets that are uncorrelated. Like if you want to minimize your volatility, put it all in cash, which is the dumbest thing you could ever do because sure. you'll wake up with less wealth because inflation will steal it all away. So you can buy something that's a little more volatile bonds and maybe you can keep up with inflation. You can buy a little more volatile stocks. But here's the myth about volatility. Volatility is not risk. Volatility is simply disagreement about the future prospects of a business. So I'll give you an example. Amazon.com and Bitcoin have the exact same volatility. 8080. This is amazing. Wow. Amazon's been a public yes. company for 27 years. In every single year of those 27 years, they've had a double digit drawdown, including this year. Okay. On average, 31%. Meaning, on average, you lose a third of your money every year, in theory. But when was the right time to sell? In fact, twice you lost more than 90%. But when was the right time to sell? Well, never. Well, who bought Amazon.com on the IPO and held it to today? There's only five people. Jeff, mom, dad, ex-wife, Bill Miller. Bill Miller's cost is seven cents, right? It's 100, <laughs> actually, no, it's, it's less than that. It's, it's, it's 0.7 cents because you just did a 10 for one split. So 0.7 cents and it's worth $177. So he was the only one that got that volatility didn't matter. What matters is the long-term accumulation of the network value. Same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the best performing asset over one, two, three, not three, one, two, four, five, 10, 15 years. Three year number is not very good because there's been volatility. But that volatility corrects itself over a long enough time horizon. There is no four year period 
in which the return on Bitcoin is negative, none in 15 years. And that volatility is a feature, not a bug, because it's uncorrelated with the other things in your portfolio. So the thing about it, I was on, I was on CNBC back in, uh, I think it was 2018. And uh, the price, while it was on the show, uh, went from about 10000 to 8000 right? So it dropped a lot, like in the six minutes, which I wasn't even on the show for very long, but in the six minutes. And Melissa Lee looks at me at the end and says, so what should we do? I'm like, we'll buy it. She says, well, you'd always say, you'd say if it went to 5000 I'm like, yeah, buy it today, buy it tomorrow, buy it next week, buy it next Don't buy it all at once. Buy some today. What Bitcoin is, it's the perfect savings technology. It's deflationary money instead of inflationary. So whereas every dollar I get paid for doing my job, converting energy to value, the government slowly steals it back from me. Over a 30-year period at 2%, they take half my purchasing power over a 30-year period. That's crazy. Okay, With Bitcoin, every dollar I save in Bitcoin over the 15 years has gone up in value, but it actually hasn't. This is the genius of it. Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, but we don't price Bitcoin in Bitcoin. We price Bitcoin in dollars, right? So the dollar has been getting less good. Continuing with Bitcoin's volatility, senior Bloomberg ETF analyst Eric Balkan has recently disclosed notable insights about spot Bitcoin ETFs. In a post shared on Monday, Balkan has revealed that all spot Bitcoin ETFs recorded inflows at the start of the week, a surprising development given last week's sudden price drops. His post read, first time ever 1D flows all green, no red for the Bitcoin bunch. Not going to spike the football like some did during the outflow period, but will point out that over 95% of ETF investors held steady during what was a pretty nasty and persistent downturn. Will the same happen next time? Who knows, but the track record suggests a high percentage again. As we said, outflows will happen, so will inflows, but over time, two things tend to be true for ETFs, net growth and relatively strong hands. Balkanus post may surprise critics of spot Bitcoin ETFs who doubted how older investors would react to Bitcoin's sudden 30% declines. These investors are generally accustomed to the mild volatility of the bond and stock markets. However, as Balkanus has mentioned in previous posts and interviews, these investors might handle Bitcoin's high volatility better than expected, given that they have only a small percentage of their portfolios allocated to BlackRock's iBit and other spot Bitcoin ETFs. In a follow-up tweet, Balkan has shared a chart of Grayscale's GBTC spot Bitcoin ETF, describing it as borderline art. He stated, this chart is ETF Hall of Fame level, borderline art. I've never seen anything like it, and probably never will again. Regardless of future market movements, Balkan expects older investors to remain steady, anticipating that prices will recover and climb higher before the bull market ends. Do you agree with his analysis? Please share your thoughts on Marcus's interview and Balkan's post in the comments section below. For more Daily Dose Crypto News, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.